Richard. Thank you very much. It's a great pleasure to be with you. Uh, this big Jew is standing between you and lunch. It's a very awkward position to be in. So I will try to provide abbreviated comments today, unfortunately. When Louis Brandeis made the very famous comment, how do you become a better American? He said you become a better American by be be becoming a better Jew. What did he mean by that? He meant that there's a relationship between the laws of Judaism and the laws of this land, our Constitution. If one were to read the book of Genesis, you see so many of the expressions that were employed by Thomas Jefferson in the Declaration of Independence. There is a relationship between the two. But when I think about Zionism, I think about something that is bred in the bone, something very different from a significant portion of the American Jewish population today that do not have the same sense that people of my generation have. I'm reminded of my father sitting in front of a big, big, big Philco radio, listening intently to a vote that was taking place at the United Nations. And after the vote was completed, my father started to cry. I had not seen my father cry. I was a child. I tried to console my dad. I said, Dad, what's wrong? He said, these are tears of joy, the state of Israel has been recognized by the United Nations. A few days later, my father started to collect weapons from his colleagues in World War II. We put all of those weapons in towels and sheets, wrapped them in cartons, put them in cartons, and we delivered them to docks in New Jersey. When we got to the dock in New Jersey, here I was with my dad, and my father said, we're putting the cartons, very heavy cartons, on a dolly. You roll the cartons to the ship. I said, Dad, I'm just a kid. Why don't you roll it? He said, because I'm likely to get arrested. No one's going to arrest this child moving this cart. So I moved the cartons. So for me, the state of Israel had a direct, direct relationship to my past. It was bred in the bone. I think about that when I think about conversations I've had with my own students at New York University and elsewhere. No longer have the same kind of sentiment. That sentiment has changed. And it's our obligation to rekindle the sentiments that once existed in the Jewish community. This is our task for the future. When one thinks about where we stand as a Jewish people, keep in mind that there are some very interesting elements developing on the world stage today that are problematic and some that represent, I think, great hope for the future. If one would have said to me that a Saudi delegation military delegation is going to move from Riyadh to Jerusalem to discuss joint military maneuvers, I would say, you're smoking hallucinogens. It's happened. Why has it happened? It's happened in large part because the Saudis and the Egyptians have come to the conclusion that there is a common enemy. That common enemy is Iran. Now, whether you can sustain this relationship remains to be seen. As Bob has pointed out, history doesn't move in a straight line. The enemies of yesterday could be your friends tomorrow. It's also true that on the border of Israel stands a united front of Iran, Russia, and Hezbollah. A new threat. A threat that one could not have possibly envisioned 10 or 20 years ago. 100,000 missiles all aimed at Israeli targets. That 100,000 missiles represents more than all of the missiles in Western Europe. And so the threat is very real. Israel, of course, has advanced technology with the Iron Dome and David's sling, but we do not know what would happen if there were saturation bombings. And so the task ahead is very real. And the reality involves the kind of moral sentiments that we bring to this discussion. A few years ago, I was invited to go to the funeral service that takes place with the Palmach Brigade, the brigade, of course, that fought in 1948, led by Yitzhak Rabin. There are 144 Jews that are buried in that cemetery, most of them quite young. I sat down at a gravestone, and at this gravestone, very different from all of the others, there was not a last name. Most of them had names like Goodstein and Schwartzberg, not this gravestone. This gravestone just said Berilat. Now, fascinating, why no last name? And so I went to the archive and I tried to find out about the history of Berlin. Berlin was brought to Auschwitz. He was 14 years old. He was broken emotionally and physically. 
broken. Did not know his name. His parents were incinerated. He had no future. He had no past. He was just there. He had one mate, one friend, who said to him, you look like a Barry. And as you know, we very often change our names. I'm Herbala, Bubala, Mamala. He became Barala. So Barala was known by all of his friends in the camp as Barala. When the war was over and the camp was liberated, Barala did not know what to do. He was told, if you go east, the Russians will arrest you. If you go west, you can't be sure about your security in these relocation camps. So he just moved through the streets of Krakow, collecting food wherever he could, very often engaging in petty robbery. One day, his friend said to him, we're leaving here. This is no light for us. And he said to Barrow, we're going to a place called Palestine. Palestine, never heard of it. He said, get on the ship, we're going to Palestine. He gets off the ship in Palestine, and someone says to him, there's a war going on here. You're going to be fighting in the war. Barilla had no idea. He goes to the Palmach Brigade, and they hand him a rifle, and they say, prepare to fight. Barilla says, I've never held a rifle before. He said, we'll give you an hour of training. They put him in the middle of a war right on the Jordanian corridor. There's very heavy fighting, and a couple of hours later, he is killed and buried with the rest of the members of the Palmach Brigade. That event, that event is very significant because when the flag, the Israeli flag is raised, and people are singing Hakikta, I'm reminded of the life of Berilla, whose blood soaks the soil of that cemetery. He gave his life for the creation of the state of independence. But Israel gave him something in return, often forgotten. He was no longer Berilla without an identity. He was no longer Berilla without a name. He was Berilla, a warrior in behalf of the state of Israel. Thank you very much.